Good morning, January people. Good morning. <laughs> Glad to see you this morning. Um, I hope that you were able to get through the snow and the ice and the, and the blowing and drifting to be here with us this morning. We, we greatly appreciate your being here with us. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, one being that next week is our annual meeting immediately after this service, and um, we would invite all of you, we encourage all of you to be here. Um, there is a copy of the annual report outside on the table in the narthex for you, so please pick one of those up as you have opportunity this week. Um, thumb through that and note the reports that are in there um, for your reading pleasure this week. And then, if you would, bring it back with you next week. Um, next week is our Holy Humor Sunday. We, to my knowledge, have never tried this before here at Emmanuel, so it's going to be kind of interesting and fun to see how it works out. We've had a few people already submit some jokes and stories and scripts to us, which we will be um, incorporating into the service, but also... If you find something that um, strikes your fancy this week that you'd like to contribute to next week's service, please do. We'll use a modified version of our regular liturgy, and for that reason, I'm going to combine our gospel lessons for uh, this week and next week, so we don't lose out any lose out on any important um, gospel lessons that we should have. Um, today, we thank Steve and Diana Tufte for their um, donation of beautiful flowers in our sanctuary in honor of their um, 25th wedding anniversary. So, congratulations. <laughs> that is a milestone. Um, John, are there any other announcements for the annual meeting that should be made? Okay. Just the annual reports are there. If you if you are going to be around anybody this week that should have one and isn't here, feel free to take one and you know try to get it to their hand, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, today we have a noisy offering. It's our uh, regular monthly noisy offering Sunday. Our um, contributions of coins and whatever else you want to put in the little bucket. Uh, we don't take credit cards or debit cards, but um, uh, we can accept paper money, um, Bitcoin, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever else you, you want to bring. Stop, if you'd like to give. So Lutheran World Relief is um, our agency this time around, and uh, in our January newsletter, there's a profile of LWR, in there, uh, it's an excellent global organization um, that is coordinated by Lutherans, uh, but serves anyone in the world in crisis um, that we can identify. So, um, please think about that and um, give generously, if you will. For the third Sunday of Epiphany, we read from Nehemiah the eighth chapter. All the people of Israel gathered together into the squares before Watergate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly. 
both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Please read responsibly Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells the tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound is gone out into all lands. And their It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the utmost edge of the mountains and runs the spots which the end of the hand. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from <coughs> presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. But the words of my mouth the second reading comes from 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For it is the one spirit we were baptized into one body. <clears throat> Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it less, any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, 
each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor and are less members of the body. No. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the, appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And remember, um, I'm going to extend a little bit beyond where this reading leaves off so that we can capture next week's Gospel as well. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, then sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless he will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the middle of them 
and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus began his public ministry at about 30 years of age. As is his custom, he comes to the local synagogue on the Sabbath. This time, it's his turn to read the scripture lesson and provide commentary for the assembly. The writers of Matthew and Mark report a similar episode, but Luke expands it and sets it as the opening act in Jesus' ministry. And Luke's version begins with unity and ends with discord, as we've just heard in the combined gospel lessons for this week and next. So what's going on here anyway? First, Luke gives the order of worship similar to what we might print in our Sunday bulletins. Notice the order of service. Most likely, um, if you've been to a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah or to a Jewish Shabbat service at the start of the Sabbath, um, you, this may seem a little bit familiar to you. And if not, just close your eyes and concentrate. And I think you'll be able to picture it. First, Jesus stands up from the congregation. Then the worship attendant, we would call this the assisting minister, hands Jesus a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Most likely, the scroll was large and heavy. Isaiah, of course, is a pretty large book. This was probably the only copy of the Torah in town because there were no personal scrolls or pew scrolls as we have today. Next, Jesus unrolls this treasured scroll and finds the text for the day, which is a combination of Isaiah 58, verse 6, and Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 in our system. Then he reads it aloud. Wouldn't it be great if we could hear Jesus' voice, to hear the volume, the pitch, the cadence, the inflection that Jesus uses as he says these words. I wish we had a recording of it. After he reads, Jesus re-rolls the scroll and returns it to the worship assistant. Then he sits down, not because he's through, but because this was the traditional posture of teaching at that time, unlike standing as I am doing today. Now the drama intensifies as the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. Everyone is filled with anticipation, waiting for what he will say next about the text he's read. And all of them were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth, and they were buzzing to each other. Is this really Joseph's son? Well, setting aside the context of Jesus' remarks for a moment, we might, in our 21st century minds, read into this that the people of Nazareth were favorable to what Jesus was saying. Now, amazed sounds like a pretty positive reaction, doesn't it? Yet the Greek term for spoke well of can also mean simply bore witness to. They heard it. They heard his sermon. They began to talk about it, and they evaluated it. But they didn't necessarily approve of it. And as for being amazed at Jesus' words, that can cut two ways. as either a wow or a woe. 
It could mean, first, either, wow, we've never heard anything like that before. It's wonderful, it's exciting. Or, it could mean, whoa, we've never heard anything like that before. That's strange and disturbing. And the comment is, this not Joseph's son also can cut two different ways. It could either be a, wow, how about that Joseph's boy? He is really something, isn't he? Trip off the old block, Nazareth's favorite son. We knew he'd make us all proud one day. Or, it could mean, whoa, this is Joseph's kid, for goodness sake, a local laborer like the rest of us. Where does he get off with these highfalutin ideas? He's no better than the rest of us. Who does he think he is? See the tension here? Is it wow or is it whoa? Or is it a little bit of both? The stunned congregation may not have known quite what to make of this adult Jesus of Nazareth. Joseph's boy, whom they watched grow up. But we, the readers of Luke's chapter 4, have a bit more background on Jesus. The opening chapters of Luke disclose that, in fact, Jesus is not exactly Joseph's boy, but rather God's own son in human flesh. Conceived by God's Spirit in Mary's womb. Perhaps in the Jewish community of Nazareth, only Mary and Joseph really know the backstory on Jesus, and perhaps they don't even <coughs> completely grasp the full picture of who Jesus is. They're still trying to wrap their heads around what God has done here. And that God has entrusted them with raising Jesus. In particular, Mary does a lot of pondering about this unusual son. So, is this not Joseph's son? Well, no, it really isn't. This is God's son becoming one of us, coming as close as you can get to us. This is amazing, astounding, and perplexing, marvelous, and mysterious. And we can't blame the people of Nazareth for not understanding who Jesus is at that point. Sometimes it's even hard for us to grasp God's incarnation in the person of Jesus. Well, whatever the mixed reactions of the crowd were at first, they soon, they soon turn to outright demonstrations of anger. After Jesus finishes his sermon, the congregation erupts with outrage. They haul him out of the synagogue and try to hurl him off a cliff at the edge of town. Instead of shaking his hands and high-fiving him and saying, good sermon, they become violent and try to wring his neck. <coughs> Somehow, Jesus manages to escape the lynching and goes on his way. As a prophet without honor in, on his home turf, he never returns to Nazareth again. And I can't say that I blame him, can you? So what in the world did Jesus okay. say in that sermon that set his neighbors and kinspeople off like that. This was not some heavy grumbling about how long the sermon was or a, a controversial point that Jesus made. This was mob action. Why would this be? First, right after reading the Isaiah text, here's what Jesus announced. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
Now think about that for a moment. This is an audacious claim. It's as if I came in here some Sunday and said, right now, folks, today, what I just read from Isaiah is being fulfilled in your midst. In fact, it's being fulfilled in me. Now, you'd probably be calling the bishop the very same day and running me out of Earlville as fast as you could. Jesus goes on, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to release the captives, give sight to the blind, and liberate the oppressed. So here Jesus appropriates the me of Isaiah's text for himself. How dare this local son say something like this? Jesus indeed makes an astonishing announcement about himself, his mission, and his moment in the salvation history of God's people. 2,000 years later, we yes, routinely speak of and sing about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our Liberator, and our Redeemer. But maybe we've gotten too comfortable with this revolutionary good news two millennia later. Maybe we even take it for granted. But the first time people heard this news in the Nazareth synagogue, it had to be absolutely mind-boggling. And perhaps it even sounded blasphemous. To a breathtaking degree, Jesus makes scripture his own. Scripture will not just inform his life, inspire his life, enrich his life. It will be his life. <coughs> he won't just read the book, study the book, proclaim the book. He will live the book. And while Jesus embodies, completely embodies scripture to a degree that we can't, he sets the pattern for us to follow. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to walk as he walked, live as he lived, as best we can. Our text makes it crystal clear that a big part of following Jesus involves bringing good news to the poor and liberating love to those bound by a legion of demons, whether those demons are physical or psychological, emotional, social, political, or spiritual. We are to help liberate the whole person. So the Isaiah text gives Jesus a manifesto for his mission. It sets the agenda for his entire life's work. And as we read the rest of Luke in the weeks and months to come, we'll see that almost everything Jesus does fits this Isaiah profile. Remember the slogan that was popular about 15 or 20 years ago? WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's been used in recent years to support all kinds of modern agendas. What would Jesus eat? What would Jesus drive? What would Jesus tweet? or put on Facebook or Meta? What would his favorite movie or TV show be? I have to say that I have no idea of the answers to those questions. Do you? Preacher Scott Spencer says this, if we want to know what Jesus would do and what we should do as his followers, we need to look at what Jesus did. He brought good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. And in our still very broken world, that's plenty to keep us busy until Christ comes again and restores all creation. Now this isn't gonna be easy to do, is it? 
The people in Nazareth were perplexed about what to do about the words trumpeted by Isaiah and Jesus. And rather than making it easier to handle, Jesus ratchets up the tension by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. I'm the one who has come to bring abundant life. This good news of liberation is not just for us and people like us, Jesus suggests. It's not just for our cozy little congregation here any more than it was for the Nazareth synagogue crowd. This is for everybody, all kinds of people, even the Gentiles, Jesus suggests. In our Gospel text today, Luke mentions the great Old Testament prophets Elijah and Elisha. These two Hebrew rock stars dramatically fulfilled Isaiah's agenda even before Isaiah even existed. While they helped their fellow Israelites, they also reached across borders to non-Israelites like the Sidonians and the Syrians suspicious or sketchy folk who were sometimes actually enemies of Israel. Why do we want to reach out to them? And that's what may have offended people in the synagogue the day Jesus was there as well. Why does he want us to extend beyond our cozy little synagogue? The people of Israel knew the familiar biblical stories about Elijah and Elisha, um, but that doesn't mean that they liked them or appreciated Jesus bringing them up now. Why, they may have wondered, is he thinking of these outsiders when the Jews had so many problems of their own to take care of in their own town and country? They may have wondered, is he turning his back on us, thumbing his nose at us? Well, if he wants to reach out to those people so much, well, we can help him along with a swift, hard kick out of Nazareth. If we're really disciples of Christ as we say we are, we should be people with a global vision of care and justice for all. Because throughout Scripture, both the Old and New Testaments, we meet a gracious God with an unshakable purpose to restore all people, all creation, to God's grand and good design. We are called to be people on a mission, God's mission, with what Scott Spencer calls Sympathetic and liberating compassion as outlined by Isaiah and fulfilled in Christ. Today, we have taken a step forward in that direction with the noisy offering that you have given and that our children have collected. This will help people living in crisis somewhere in our troubled world, even though they may not be our people. We, we will not know where our money goes. So our mission today is to take God's word, to read it and read it frequently, read it well so that it becomes a part of us, and then, as Jesus did, to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.